I may have been tailgating the SUV in front of me for a few kilometers of highway. When we stopped in the next town to use the little boy's room, I emerged to find that SUV parked beside our van. Apparently our Delica is recognizable at 110 kilometers an hour on twisting Kiwi highways. Ashley introduced himself as the new owner of Marwea Motels. Now, we hadn't been to the Marwea Motels in a decade. Our first three trips to New Zealand, it was the hub of our fly fishing, having befriended a previous owner and staying weeks on end. Ashley and his wife, Amber, and son Artie came over from Australia to live the dream of owning and operating a motel in the heart of New Zealand's fly fishing. We hadn't stopped by in years, and the entire facility had a serious makeover and upgrade, though not much had really changed. The bird song still vibrant in the native bush, the rooms quiet and set back into the hills, the lush beach forest, and epicenter to some seriously good fly fishing. We used to march the nearby creek to its very top end, so it was a logical starting point for our first day. A series of gorges are separated by braided gravel and forest. The fish populations always ebb to the water conditions. As long as spring rains continued flows, the fish stuck around. We were there late January, but the rains had been so miserable that there were several fish about. But the recent weather turned to hot and dry had the fish a little funky. Several were doggo, and others were on the move to the main river. We managed to find a few stationed and willing. So Ashley, you, you're telling me that the, there's been a fair bit of pressure on, on this little bit of water this year. Yeah, everywhere this year. It's sort of 10 times what it usually is. It's, it's the mouse fish thing, eh? Hey? Yeah. And yeah, so there's, there's obvious big fat mice fish. Um, so in you telling me that, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to three X on the on the dry. This fish is not gonna come up for the dry, and I'm just gonna start off with I don't know what do you figure 18 inches down to a, a slender nymph, and see if we can't just feather a cast in there and maybe not spook the fish first cast. He's pretty shallow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and how happy is he, Dave? Oh, he's happy enough to spook. He, he looks like he wants to swim. <laughs> So because we expect this fish to spook straight away and we expect the fish to be really shy, uh, we're going small and that's that's why I've got a little size 14 elk hair caddis. Now it's broken water so if I can slide a cast in there I you know it, sh it should do the trick and it will float the tungsten nymph underneath but to ensure that it does I'll just kind of back comb that and then kind of lay that down that way that that deer hair or elk hair is splayed a little bit just enough to just enough to kind of get some buoyancy built into that fly i don't expect the fish to eat the dry fly that's why i can get away with that and hopefully that fish will just come up uh slide over and eat that nymph but the idea is to back home surface area and and allow it to float more than it normally would
Yeah, that's, that's exactly it, eh? Yeah. You yeah. saw me being a pussy on the outside, outside, <laughs> outside, trying to draw them across. And yeah, then, yeah. And just using that faster water. To as cover, it, right? Yeah. And, you know, you, you eventually just say, you know, I got to go at it. And I went straight at it, and, and, and I was expecting him to come because my nymph landed to the left, and I thought he's going to come yeah, yeah. that way. I don't think he saw that first one. Or, no. Or then he pops and takes the dry, and it was like, nah. It <laughs> a mouse fish that ate a caddis. <laughs> But yeah. then after that, it was just, you ain't landing that fish, you know, it was probably, what, a six, seven pound mouser anyway? I could have, I could have swam harder. You could, oh, I thought you, Yeah. You, you're not sporting your flippers and, and your no. snorkel. And it's kind of disappointing when your host doesn't wear his snorkel and, and flippers. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Yeah, less dedicated. But that's one of those fish that you don't, you, you, you project that it's going to spook. And yeah, you, so, you, so you kind of play it shy. Yeah, yeah. And then you think, well, I better go at it. And then you think, okay, oh, and he takes a dry. But then the compounding issue is you're not going to stop a uh, fat freight train. I, it, I'm, I'm probably underselling that with six or seven pounds because those mice fish, even though they're only that big, are eight pounds. Yeah, yeah. A full pound head. Yeah. yeah. And into that, it went, I thought I had a chance, but there was that one lingering stick Did of the go head. Under? Yeah. yeah. And it was over. I tried, but uh, hey, yeah. but that's how it goes. I mean, hand your, your percentages just go. Boof. Yeah, and I like it's done everything that you said it wouldn't, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a fish that really I projected the worst case scenario, as in he's not going to eat the dry, he's not going to allow me to cast and get a drift anywhere near him, and he's going to spook, he's going to do all sorts of nasty things. If you work within that and you say, okay, that's the worst case scenario, here's what I need to do based on that, then you have all sorts of options and you know how limited your options are but how you have to approach to the fish you have to get in position what cast you have to make where you cast your dry and dropper in relation to the fish and you just have a go based on those things now the best case scenario happened and it came and ate my dry but as soon as he ate my dry well now the next worst case scenario is there's no chance in hell i'm landing the fish because of all the debris from the big floods this year and well i was pretty accurate on that at least uh, but you just have a go and you have a go based on the, on the worst case scenario, you hope for the best, but the point is, have a go, try, and sometimes you get lucky, uh, sometimes you don't, but you don't know if it's the dry fly eat or the net job or the lack of net job, you don't know where that, <laughs> the bad stuff's gonna happen, but you gotta try. And you respected his feeding window on those first couple casts, yeah. and you realized, hey, he's not gonna come that far over, no. so let's just go at the fish. I was really being a wuss, I was projecting yeah. he was gonna spoof right like that, and no, he wasn't. And now that the sun's coming out, I bet you the next fish does. <laughs> <laughs> we moved upstream. We were a little early, and the light gave brutal glare on a run Ashley was keen to fish. We split the stream and found what he was looking for. He's, he's in a great spot, and he's feeding, and, he's, and there's no big log jam for you to get jammed in on, so I expect nothing but good things bombs away. Since they're not taking dries, I'm going to try for a caddis, something similar that's worked just before, and then and then drop it sort of, what's that, 18 inches to a, a simple mayfly little bead head. And You want to give them the option of the bead, or do you want to just, just go dry, dry, dry only? Double dry. Huh? Huh? There you go. You really There's the challenge, hey? <laughs> do you want a nymph eat, or do you want a dry eat? Maybe he does. Well, exactly. Your choice. Do you, really, no, do you want to give him the option? Let me just look at this fish for a second. <laughs> yeah. What's he doing? Dave goes, I haven't <laughs> seen, he goes, I haven't seen him rise once. No. You saw him rise oh, once. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's nothing worse than a guy's <laughs> second guessing, you, oh, you got to drive that double dry fly. You know, yeah, you, yeah. you got to do it just and to psych you out. And that little bit of hesitation <laughs> sort of really went through the line. Well, it was, it came right over, hey? Like mm. you were just nicely, what, two feet to the right and came down on the sand. Yeah, he fed as a little caddis emerger that I was sort of trying to keep the dry, two dries, so keep keep everyone happy. But no, he no. had to go with the dropper now. Yeah, and, yeah, and so. um, yeah, I felt weight, I let him go down. Um, so with all that, I don't know, uh, maybe the dropper was a touch too long to indicate in that water maybe? I don't know. Uh, what is that? Yeah, it's only about 18 inches. Maybe 
to, uh, to second guess, okay, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, you had to go with 10 or 12 inches instead of 18 so that when that it took, pause wasn't it, yeah, penduluming. Exactly. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it just didn't, it, it could have come out yeah. here. It could have, yeah. I'm blaming it on the massive kite. Yeah. Go with, yeah, that, Let's that, go that, with that. that alligator. <laughs> you know, it's you Aussies and your alligators. Yeah, like exactly. Crocs, that was or a whatever it is. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't always come. That's right. It? That's what makes you keep on. And next. Yeah, next. <laughs> As luck would have it, next was literally across the stream in less than a foot of water under a gravel wall undercut. It turned out to be a neat engagement as the fish sat in a calm pillow underneath while the water six inches to its right was heavy. Ashley and I weren't getting it done, so it was up to Amelia to kickstart the day. Well, we got a fish holding. He's tight to the bank in sort of the fastest part of the ripple over here and uh, not seen him come up at all. Um, I'm definitely thinking that the nymph is the way to go. So I'm putting on about a 20 inch uh, dropper to a tungsten nymph, um, probably just some sort of pheasant tail, um, decent feed, get it down and we'll see what happens. Something in there yeah, never fails, but yeah, keep the blackhead, the gold. Might blackhead. even do that. I just want to make sure that this will float it. Mine will, it should float that. Uh, the thing is, it's got to get down. Because right? he's only swinging out, what, every two, three minutes, but it's not like a big aggressive but come out. This will indicate real well? Yeah. It wasn't going to be an easy cast. Little upstream space to lead a fish that simply wasn't swinging out at all. A heavy tungsten bead to get down quick, and fast current pushing the fly away from the wall all conspired to force a tight cast that had to be even tighter than we thought. And just having to work hard it for that. It just is, right? Yeah, yeah it's awesome. Adds to the Thank you. So, so that was a lot of cast, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, he was willing, right? You made so. it rain almost on him, so that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that fish, I guess he, you know, holding tight to the bank. And we were willing, he, we could tell he was willing to swing out and, and take nymphs. He wasn't, he wasn't going to come for the dry. And we knew that early on after what trying to sedge in a mayfly. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, okay, let's put on a nymph. Um, he actually swung out and, and I took a few casts when he was actually kind of more out in the middle of the river. Yeah, right? and he did look at a, that pheasant tail, but. Yeah, and I, it was kind of like made a bit of a stop and we thought, and I tried to set, but it, obviously he hadn't taken or if he had, I, I missed yeah. it. But it didn't bother hesitant. him. No, and he was happy again. So. Yeah, right? So then, sure enough, uh, go back in there. And yeah, I finally got, I knew it was the cast because I was able to lead it and get it just close enough yeah. to to his feeding. Long enough to you drop know, down Yeah, and so. then he, of course, decided to drop out. And I guess the biggest thing there is a fish that's holding that tight to the bank and kind of has to drop to take the nymph. Got to wait a little longer on that hook set. And that's you probably know, what right? happened in that first time and why it didn't quite go under and a woof. Exactly, and a right? Stop, so. But yeah, pretty cool. I tied my own uh, caddis pupa uh, nymph and yeah, it's always fun. He wanted when to make you, you feel good, huh? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really fun moment. When Ashley suggested we all fish this creek at the start of the day and I won the rock, paper, scissors match to take on the first brown, I was fretting the next few hours. I really wanted to take on one particular pool that had always been good to us. A stunning location I've always connected to its beauty, just an intense sense of what creeks like this in New Zealand are about. I consider myself extremely fortunate for how our rotation played out and also for how this all came together. 
Every time we fished this corner, the fish have been in the heart, the head, or the tail. I cleared the tail, and just as I was set to march across, I caught the ever slightest green glow of a trout. I can't describe what it looked like well. It was cocked 45 degrees vertically along the wall, its belly literally holding and likely touching the rock wall. It was more gecko than trout in its position. This one wasn't going to be easy in that location and behavior, as again, like most fish that day, it simply wasn't active. So that pool there, you know, normally has a waterfall coming off the side and normally it's a big deep pool and you know, because you've fished there lots and back in the day, you know, 13 years ago when we first started fishing here, that pool always had, for us, yeah. two fish, one on the tail out, one on the head, that search. And we, oh, I think all three of us were looking into the oh, obvious oh, spot mm -hmm. and just one step and I looked over and there was that glowing right kind of angled on the rock wall. The way he was climbing that wall, he was mass surfing the bounce He needed a, a gecko tail, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, <it's laughs> fun. Um, but, yeah, and from there it was, well, the sun's coming straight across and I had to cast across the sun and I was just waiting for the spook and it was like, uh, He was very happy. He was. But you needed that nymph almost to turn it over. Yeah, because the wind the... was coming around the corner, hitting the wall and in my face. Not that you could tell now. No. Yeah, but gusts of little, just pain in the ass, little pops of wind. Mm -hmm. No, I just needed that tungsten to just carry it through. Yes. And as soon as it did that, it was right in that seam and the fish came out and down. I don't know what Amelia got up with the camera because the fish was going to have to eat downstream. She reckons she got it. Okay, well, yeah. we'll, we'll hold her to that then, yeah. Anyway, and then after that, the circus show of trying to land that fish. Yeah, it was a bit of a bulls up <laughs> yeah. several times. But that's when you find out 
in lowish water when you're hooked onto a fish, just how far that the water has scoured that hard rock. It's a good meter underneath, and yeah. then it comes up into a cave. Yeah, and it's like of, he was spelunking. That. <laughs> anyway, that was awesome, man. Right on. I was happy to get that one to hand. It was my last go at a fish that day. After that, we ran into exactly what maddens anglers in New Zealand. Sheer beauty with trout that leave you exasperated. As the sun came out, the contrast solidified. Beach forests and bright sun leave the tiniest pockets along the rock walls in possible viewing. Far too much time is spent spotting the shallowest of non-trout habitat, and yet you step on a good fish in prime pockets you simply couldn't see. We walked past water that screamed trout, but they'd clearly moved into rippled seams. Conditions were changing. The creek was low, water warming, and each fish had its own personality. We didn't know which fish were doggo, nor which were active, but just waiting food's arrival. As Ashley and Amelia's starkly different lux would show, you never know what kind of trout you're lining up on in these conditions. so beautifully lovely, lovely time, and right? raise it, rising but he's obviously doing this in this pool every what half he an hour or he's on his right? beat yeah. yeah and he's usually actually down here in this up against that but yeah he just dropped down beside me to, to have a look and push that dry fly right out of his mouth unreal it was like you know we could all see him coming yeah and then of course in the slow-mo that Dave was able to get you just see him come and he pushes the water yeah. and kind of turns. Big bow wave. And that the, timing of, you And know, it did, it shot the, shot the dry fly a good inch or inch and a half away from him. It was hungry, hungry oh, hippo. Oh, yeah, yeah, hey. Hey, that's life. What are you going to do? Yeah, yeah when yeah. they drop, I mean, the thing is, you can still have a go. And that's what's neat is that yeah. that fish is super close and you think it's over. Yeah, no, no he's still Why don't you feeding. just go for it? And on dry as well. It's possible. Doesn't always connect and stick, but yeah. still can happen, right? In the absolute hindsight of time in 180 frames per second video, it appears that the cast likely led the fish ever slightly too much, and because of the close proximity to the trout, no rod movement mending could occur. Just as the fish came to the fly was the same moment micro drag of the drift was occurring, and once the fish pushed the fly, you can clearly see the full drag effect of the main current pulling on the fly. This run had several trout in it. The larger fish were motionless and tight to the bank, a classic sign that they were shutting down, the water warm, the recent angling pressure high, and that they were likely dropping to the main river in the next day or two. Rather than target the dank, minky, lethargic big fish, Amelia chose to leave it alone in favor of the smaller, happier, actively feeding brown cruising the run with an 18 inch dropper.
It was clear that the four fish in this run had already dropped from the long runs of flat water upstream. We walked the next hour without seeing a fish. We found one set up on the inside edge of a bar, but the water was so low, so flat, that it was incredible Ashley managed to get a cast to it without spooking it, let alone sliding his flies in there and actually getting a look. But otherwise, that was it. That was the last fish of this day. In our next episode, day two of our time with Ashley, we'll be on another tributary stream. The conditions were even tougher, and it became a day that we truly had to apply ourselves in order to catch the gorgeous fish that we did. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel and take the time to comment about what you enjoyed or ask any questions that you might have.